Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. On Perpetual Chess, I have weekly conversations with the chess world's best players, promoters, and educators about their lives, careers, current projects, and best practices. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. I am super excited for my guest this week. He's pretty good at chess. He uh, has been as high as number 14 in the world. He's currently slumming it at number 24 in the world. He's an eight-time champion of the Czech Republic. David Navarra, uh, Mr. Navarra, thank you for joining us. You are welcome. So I really... I really appreciate your taking the time, David. When we were emailing and setting this up, you mentioned you're going away for three consecutive events, uh, chess events, in a few days. So where are you headed? Uh, okay, I w- I'm going to play the French League now, uh, and then uh, several games in the Polish League, and then a match against the, the strongest or highest rated uh, Chinese player in Prague. Uh, I mean, uh, not a Chinese player in Prague, but right. uh, I'm going to play a match which is going to take place in Prague. And uh, okay, so I will be quite busy. So what's the format of the match? Uh, we will play uh, about 12 uh, rapid games and uh, three games per day. Uh, and uh, if it's tight, then some t- blitz tie break. Okay, and uh, I should know who the Chinese number one is. Obviously, it's a short list of candidates, but but who who is currently Chinese number one? Okay, I know it, but uh, the problem is that the international pronunciation differs quite a lot from Chinese one. Uh, I mean, in the English transcription, is uh, Ding Li Ding Li Ren. Uh, Chinese pronunciation is probably something like Ding uh, Li Ding Li Ren, or something like this, uh, but. Uh, Somewhat different. Okay, yeah, and he's uh, he had a, a nice showing at the candidates. A strong young player, so it should be a great match. Yes. Um, so how do you prepare for a match like that, David? Okay, to be honest, now I'm not preparing for the match at all. Because, uh, <laughs> That's my kind Friday, of preparation. Okay, I would like to, but on Friday I'm leaving for the French League. I'm going to play up to 11 games there. Then I will get back, go to Poland almost immediately, play three more games, and uh, then get back, play a blitz tournament in Prague, and uh, then play the match. So uh, I'm not happy about this schedule, but uh, it, it happens to me quite often at, during this part of the year. And uh, okay, it this time it happened... Uh, because I somehow promised to play the French league, and then I realized it was uh, it was overlapping with the Polish league, unfortunately. So and my club, uh, who was the champion or who is the champion, uh, somehow disliked this because uh, about four or five players from the club are going to play in France as well. So the. Uh, and the schedule was changed, and Polish league take, takes place just uh, after French league. Okay, so, so busy, to... busy life of a chess professional. Yes. Uh, so who's on your team in the French league? Okay, my team is not the strongest, but okay, still quite good. There's, for example, uh, Matthias Blibaum of Germany, uh, and uh, Benjamin Gledura uh, of Hungary. Uh, they are both... Uh, Get strong grandmasters rated over 2,600. And uh, we have uh, some more grandmasters like uh, Grandmaster Andrei Istratescu uh, from uh, Romania who has been playing for France uh, for many, for several years. And also Grandmaster Andrei Sokolov who uh, once played a candidate uh, final, I think against the Grandmaster Karpov in 1985, I suppose. And so you said your team is not the strongest. Uh, who will you be competing against? Anyone especially notable? Okay, there are two very strong teams. One of them uh, is Bishvila, uh, and there are players like Shakhria Mamegyarov, Arkagi Naidic, Etienne Bakro, and uh, 
several other very strong grandmasters, and then there is a team of cliché uh, where uh, there are players like Maxime Bachier Lagraf, uh, Laurent Fresnay, and uh, several others. I mean, uh, I just forgot to mention many more strong players. I, I just don't remember it by heart who is playing. I know Maxime Rochstein is also playing for uh, for Bishvilla and uh, many other strong grandmasters for Clichy as, as well. So, yeah, it doesn't sound like you're going to get many rounds off. You're gonna you're gonna have to be sharp every round, I guess. Yes, I mean those players are playing for two strongest teams, and the other teams are not bad either. I mean they also have quite strong grandmasters, and the top board is uh, quite. Uh, strong and it's not going to be easy um yeah i i don't well i i do and don't envy you at the same time <laughs> the, mm-hmm. the travel and the being as good as you are sounds good to me but of course being me they, it wouldn't go so well if i played um but so when you play this match do you only play i imagine your first board for your team do you only play other first boards or is it like a mixed schedule where you play different boards from different teams uh, okay, I mean, in each country, I can play just for one team. Uh, so I don't know if I understood your question properly, but oh, as for sorry, first I, board, I can clarify. Do you? Board, uh, sorry, uh, I mean, in Europe, uh, during the season, we cannot change teams uh, usually, but I can play in uh, several leagues. Uh, during the same season, so I'm playing in Germany, Czech Republic, of course, Poland, France, and so on. And uh, in France, uh, I I might sometimes play on board one, sometimes on board two, because it's uh, sort of flexible. I mean, if uh, there are players with similar rating, up to uh, 100 point difference, they can switch places uh, in the lineup. Okay. So, yeah, what I meant, and I think I know the answer to this, but what I meant was just like as board one, you only play the other team's board one, right? Uh, yes. Okay. I mean, but, I know that's the more common format, but lately with the Pro Chess League and stuff, they've been mixing it up a little bit. Yes. I mean, it's uh, so in many leagues, but in France, it's uh, sort of tricky because I can also play on board two. Uh, this time, and uh, for example, if some team is... Uh, very strong. There are players who can play on board one, but uh, also on board six. So exactly in France, it's somewhat tricky, but uh, I'm going to play just one opponent. Uh, but uh, we, it's uh, determined uh, before uh, several hours before the match. But uh, I mean, the teams can, uh, can change it up to some extent. I mean, uh, there is a, Difference. Uh, there is a limit of 100 rating points, and uh, if the difference between the players is bigger, then the stronger player needs to play on the higher board. Okay, so you don't know exactly who you're going to play, like which individuals? Um, I don't know. Okay, so that makes preparation tricky, I guess. Yes, okay, we will have uh, several hours for the preparation anyway, but uh, okay, still it's good that I can switch places with uh, someone else, uh, with, perhaps this time and generally when you're getting ready for a big trip like this with a bunch of high level chess uh how do you prepare yourself okay i'm trying to uh, to keep myself fresh uh, to solve some uh, tactic uh, puzzles and so on to read some chess literature uh, to follow some elite events and so on to analyze my games and to uh, Okay, during the tournament, I, I'm i usually preparing quite a lot. Uh, so that's uh, what I'm doing. Do you have any f- favorite chess literature? You like? Do you, Are you reading like periodicals or just reading the latest books? Or what's, what's your flavor of choice? Okay, to be honest, nowadays I'm may- mostly reading the periodicals uh, because I'm reading New in Chess. Uh, then uh, one German chess magazine, then uh, one Russian chess magazine, uh, one or two Czech chess magazines, and uh, all together it's already five, and uh, three of them in foreign languages, so 
it's also a sort of language training, but okay, I'm training my reading abilities and comprehension, um, but uh, I mean reading comprehension, but uh, okay, when it comes to speaking, I might sometimes be rusty anyway. <laughs> It's amazing that you speak so many languages. And actually, that, that calls to mind a question. Uh, what we do on this podcast, David, is um, I for people who have uh, supported the podcast, I send a list out. Uh, I let them know in advance who's coming on, and they can submit questions. And, you know, I'm lucky enough to have an industrious... Uh, supporters who not only submit questions but point me to like you know information, so I'm well prepared. Um, so he, so uh, Timothy Ha found a great interview that you did with uh, Fiona um, in yes. 2016 that I'll uh, be referring to later. But he had a follow up question based on reading that interview, which was he saw that you read Russian, English, French, and Polish, and he asked why that choice of languages to learn. Yes. I mean, sorry that you speak Russian, English, French, and Polish. Okay, I can speak several languages, and in fact, my French is not really great. I mean, I, I started late and the, then sort of stopped, uh, so my French is not really good. Uh, but okay, I'm, I can speak English and Russian fluently, even though you sometimes might uh, doubt if it's fluent enough. No, it's quite fluent. And okay, my German is also quite decent. My Polish is not really bad. It's uh, decent as well, but okay, it's a very similar language. Maybe not very similar, but still similar uh, to both uh, Czech and Russian. And okay, I can also speak uh, some other languages, but rather badly. I mean, uh, okay. I don't know. I've done enough traveling to know that when a European says they speak a language badly, it's not the same thing as when an American says they speak the language badly. Yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'm living in the Central Europe, which means that uh, I'm surrounded uh, by. Okay, Czech Republic is surrounded, um, being surrounded by many countries with their own languages, and uh, I'm playing quite often in Poland. So Polish language was uh, sort of important for me. The same, uh, the same uh, applies uh, for German, of course. Uh, okay, English is uh, more or less obligatory nowadays, and uh, Russian language is also a Slavonic language. And uh, okay, it's uh, very useful for a chess player to know Russian language. Yes, for sure. Uh, yeah, that that was the one I studied in college. Although my Russian skills are uh, withering away, um, so do you think it's true? People say that there's a correlation between the ability to like talent for chess and talent for languages. I don't know. I think it depends because there are some, there are some players who know quite many languages. I think Sergei Movsesian is one of the biggest stars in this respect because he speaks about nine languages, but oh, he <laughs> That's speaks amazing. without accent. I mean, he makes some mistakes sometimes in uh, Polish, for example, because he likes practice, but uh, he speaks without accent. Uh, and uh, he... Uh, has a, he probably has some musical talent or s something, but I mean chess players are usually uh, clever, and uh, people who know many languages are uh, tend to be clever as well. But uh, I don't know if it if there is any special correlation because when I was fifteen, I could only speak bad English. Uh, okay, uh, what, and. Uh, I knew some basics of Russian, but okay. Since then, I became interested in foreign languages and achieved, uh, qu achieved quite a lot. Uh, but okay, I'm no specialist. I mean, I'm just a person who likes studying foreign languages, uh, who likes to study foreign languages. But uh, okay, I st I'm still making mistakes uh, because, okay, I'm no... Uh, no interpreter and no uh, no i mean it's not my job right okay well I, like i said i mean m most people w would love to speak as many languages as you it's quite impressive uh but let's get back to your chess playing because you've i mean being being at such a lofty perch being such a strong player and having been around for a little while You've played probably like every current famous chess player, I'm guessing. And I know that you had a match against Karpov. Uh, and of course, you had a very famous game against Kasparov recently. So when you reflect on your career, what, what are the, your fondest memories? Okay, it's hard to say, but uh, 
I like the, some of my performances in uh, team events like chess olympiads and uh, so on. For example, I'm very fond of uh, the fact that my team Novi Bor won the European Club Cup in 2013 ahead of uh, Sokar, which was filled uh, up with uh, elite players. I mean, they had Anish Giri on board seven and he was hi rated higher than me. I was playing on board to one, incidentally, but okay, I was not the most uh, successful player of our team, but we somehow managed to beat Sokar, uh, who was playing with uh, Grandmasters, uh, with Grandmasters Topalov, uh, uh, Karwana, uh, Kamsky, uh, Mamedyarov, uh, Giri and uh, Wang Hao uh, against us. And uh, I mean, we were not bad, but uh, we were quite lucky in this match and we somehow managed to win the tournament. I mean, uh, okay, we were lucky. Maybe some other team deserved the victory more, but uh, in the next year we finished second and it was quite a deserved second place. So <laughs> I'm fond, fond of this. And also of... Uh, for example, my gold medal on board two at the Chess Olympiad in Istanbul 2012, which is probably my best result ever. But okay, there were more such results. I mean, so it's interesting that you mentioned primarily team events. Do you find those to be uh, like more rewarding? I don't know. It's hard to say because I'm usually performing better in team events. Uh, I don't know why, because uh, I tend to be a, the, an individualist, uh, but okay, I like my teams. Uh, maybe I'm taking the events more seriously. And uh, as for individual performances, I could mention my victories or my shared first place in the mind uh, in uh, Germany, uh, where I played a big rapid tournament. There were about 750 participants, uh, including some top players like Grandmasters uh, Ivanchuk, uh, Kamsky, uh, Mamedyarov once again, Akopian, who was in top 20 back then, and uh, I, Grishuk, and I somehow managed to share the first place with uh, nine and a half out of 11. I even lost the last game because I became too nervous and, <laughs> okay, too surprised by by winning the tournament or by sharing the first place. Uh, and uh, okay, I once won uh, European Blitz Championship uh, quite surprisingly in 2014. Uh, and uh, I scored something like 19 out of 22, which was great. And uh, as for classical chess, which I rate higher than Rapid and Blitz, so there were some events. Okay, I'm eight time Czech champion. I mean, uh, it was not easy at all because uh, there are some strong players participating. I mean, it's not all of us, uh, I mean, not all of them, but uh, often many of them were playing. And okay, one thing is to win such a tournament where you are a favorite, and another thing is to win it eight times. Yeah, it's incredible. I mean, it's, and you're you're not that, you know, fairly young man. So. <laughs> So yes. ho hopefully you haven't won it for the last time. Yes, I also hope I will win it. <laughs> when uh, is uh, when is the next one? Okay, in one year, more or less. Uh, the next uh, champ the last championship took place uh, w in Ostrava in May, and I was not playing because uh, it uh, overlapped a bit with uh, Shamkir Chess uh, in Azerbaijan. I mean, Vugar Gashimov Memorial, where I performed quite badly. I s finished last. Uh, losing four games and drawing the remaining five. Yeah, so, you know, the life of any chess professional is going to have ups and downs. When you compare something like your 9.5 out of 11 result that you mentioned versus things not going the way you would like in Shamkir, do you do you notice any patterns? Uh, I, think, I don't know if there are any patterns. I mean, of course, the opponents in Shamkir were much stronger because uh, they were about nine players including me from top 20 or maybe top 21 i don't know exactly and uh, one more player who was also rated about two, above 2700 
so it was quite strong and in such tournaments you need to be perfectly fit and focused and so on and when you are not uh, you lose some games and the other opponents uh, will try to beat you then yeah they sent they sense weakness don't they they're, yes they're... exactly and uh, in the chess olympiad i was uh, then exceptionally playing on board too which was not really weak but still it was not the same level as a uh, board one because the victor lasnicka played against guild masters like uh, nakamura and adams then with black which was tough which was tough and he did well uh, and I played on board too, and I didn't start so well. I think it was a sort of miracle because I had some problems uh, with before the tournament, and they somehow miraculously disappeared still before the tournament. But <laughs> I mean, it can hardly be explained. And uh, then I was uh, playing, uh, I was focused, and so on. I didn't start particularly well, but uh, then I won six games against grandmasters in a row. Yeah, so you just kind of never know when a breakthrough is coming, I guess. Yes, I mean, I'm a player who can win many games in a row, especially, I mean, against uh, somewhat lower-rated players, but still strong. But uh, uh, on the other hand, nowadays it's more difficult because uh, the theory has progressed and uh, it's easier for the players who know the theory to make a draw is white if they want to or... It's more difficult for me to get some advantage or at least playable position with white pieces and to survive the opening with black pieces. So one needs to work harder uh, and to work on the openings more than before, which is not something which would suit me. Also, the computers are quite uh, strong nowadays. And I mean, I'm trying to keep up with uh, with uh, the technological progress but uh, I'm always uh, some world behind not only in comparison with the absolute with the absolute elite uh, sorry elite but uh, also in comparison with uh, players uh, rated about about uh, 2700 so so I'm in okay my preparation is not that great I mean from time to time I'm uh, cooperating with my friends who are also strong great masters and uh, we can generate some ideas but uh, I mean nowadays it's not uh, no longer easy to win many games in a row so you've mentioned in previous interviews that uh, since you were uh, you had a quote in an interview where you said that since you were a kid you uh, your openings were a weakness of yours so that got you used to playing poor positions which I thought was funny and somewhat instructive that it's not all a bad thing but now that you're you know now that you're an adult and you know one of the world's best players um, how come is this like a weakness that you think you could correct or is it just that you just don't like preparing for openings or why why do you think it is that others have have better opening knowledge than you okay i even uh, somehow learned to like the work on the openings but okay i'm saying it's a weak, weakness which can be corrected but it would cost uh, too much effort or too much money or probably too much of both uh, because, I mean, the top players usually have uh, strong seconds uh, who are working uh, full-time for them, or not full-time, but uh, quite intensively for them, and uh, they are using uh, some uh, very efficient computers, uh, powerful computers. And, okay, I have just a laptop, I mean, decent one, but I don't even want to buy a supercomputer because... Uh, I would need to uh, cool it somehow and uh, okay do to place it somewhere and I mean I'm not all the time at home and uh, I'm not a player who would like to uh, turn on the computer go to bed and uh, in the morning wake up and see what the computer found I mean yeah, I'm not intense. really used to doing this uh, I mean uh, I'm analyzing this computer quite a lot when I'm preparing but uh, it, I just uh, that's uh, just what I'm mentioning. I am analyzing with the computer. It's not the computer analyzing without me. And uh, or if it is, when it is, then it's uh, just a rare occasion. And uh, 
I mean, I'm cooperating with some cooperating with some friends, but uh, okay, I'm I have a trainer, but we are not uh, collaborating so much nowadays. Uh, we are not working together so much because uh, my trainer, Grandmaster Jansa, who is 75 year old, is a living legend, and he is still very active and following the following the latest trends in the openings but uh, okay still he has also other work i have also other work and i mean i'm not working on on the openings uh, as uh, intensively as the others are i suppose yeah that makes sense i recently had uh Vidic garaji who's almost who's very close to to your rating currently and he he mentioned a similar thing that he felt like he'd reached a level where if he wanted to go higher, he needed a team. And he was actually in the process of uh, trying to, to raise money um, and put out feelers to make to make that happen, to, to put together the yes. team. Did you ever consider doing something like that? Not really. Okay. Vedit Gujarat is, uh, I think, 12 years younger than me. I don't... Uh, okay, maybe not 12, maybe 11. I don't know exactly. But, uh, okay, he can still make a progress and so on. But okay, I have never searched for a big sponsor because I want to remain independent, uh, say what I want to say uh, and to, to, okay, I mean, I don't need more money. I think it's uh, sort of strange that in the modern world, world, people who get the highest, the biggest support are often the richest people, which is sort of strange. I mean, I can live without a sponsorship. I can earn decent money, very good money compared to an average salary in the Czech Republic. Um, okay, it would not be so great money in the US, but okay, still I can make a living without any difficulties now and uh, also save some money for uh, more difficult times. So I don't, I don't uh, see any necessity in uh, getting a sponsor. I mean, if I wanted to create a team, I could invest a big uh, part of my income to do that. But I think it's not worth it. I mean, I'm not a player who would aspire to get into top 10. I, I know I'm clever. I'm talented, but uh, there are more clever and more talented players. And okay, they will always play better than me, and uh, they are uh, also often younger than me. But okay, I can play against them. I can occasionally beat them. Uh, I can play many interesting games. Maybe my result against the elite is. Uh, I'm sorry. My results against the elite are not really great, but uh, I played many interesting games. Uh, against strong grandmasters who are not uh, in top uh, 50 or so, but uh, still, I think those games are worth seeing. Yeah, well, a lot of it, I, I get what you're saying, and it's great. I think you, you have such a grounded perspective, and you're very modest, and I, I have questions related to that as well. But but one thing just uh, that, that came to mind as you were talking about this is it, it's not, I'm sure with someone like Vita from his perspective and from any anyone trying to crack the top 10 the it's great that uh that there's financial reward um and you know probably exponential reward for going from saying 25 to number 5 in the world but i'm sure like as a competitive person it's not just about that uh like to to devote your life and reach such an incredible level where you know you're the best player in your country and you know only a you know two handfuls of people in the world uh, are consistently higher rated than you. So it, to me, and I think to a, to a lot of listeners, it would be not just about the money, but just like uh, trying to um, to maximize uh, your potential or to, um, you know, just to see what would happen. Okay, I, do, I know, but uh, it's hard to say what does it mean to maximize my potential because, okay, if I didn't enter, uh, okay, if I hadn't entered a uh, university, uh, I could have uh, uh, done better in chess. Uh, but, uh, okay, maybe I would have got to number 10 in the world and then dropped back later on. 
to number 20, but okay, now I have a master degree in logic, which I quit uh, simultaneously with finishing my studies. And uh, I mean, uh, I realized, uh, I had realized uh, long before that I would not be a good logician and I was not that talented uh, in this field. Uh, but okay, I have a master degree and uh, if I sometimes decide to quit chess for any reason, I will probably be able to find some decent job because, okay, I know some foreign languages, okay, my, uh, okay, I mean, uh, my knowledge is not perfect and uh, my speaking abilities uh, need uh, some improving, uh, I mean, need some improvement. And, uh, Okay, but I more or less know how to formulate sentences. Uh, I just uh, tend to be too slow because I lack practice. But uh, I mean, I achieved quite something. And uh, okay, I could achieve, I could have achieved more in chess, but I would have achieved less in other fields. So it's uh, always yeah, it's it's good to have it's good to have balance. Um, I, I think it's commendable to to be a well-rounded person. I, I it's just uh. Um, sorry. Okay, I don't know. Sorry for interrupting you. I don't know if I'm really a well-rounded person. I think I'm not. But okay, at least I'm trying. And uh, maybe some top players are as well, and they are better players than me. But okay, Lavon Argan is of course more talented than me. Magnus is more talented. So what can be done? I know I'm not the most talented and the most clever player in the world. I mean, I mean okay, I remembered what I was going to say, which is just, I, like I say, your your modesty is quite refreshing. It's just, it's it's funny for me, for me, and I for me to hear someone who's who's so strong, because uh, the chess players often are delusional, like, you know, throughout as you ascend the ranks in chess, everybody thinks they're underrated. And, and here you are basically at the pinnacle. Um, and you're you're so modest about your abilities compared to the, you know, the handful of people who are higher rated than you. So I just wonder personally, if like, if it's possible, I know that, that you took the decision to go to university. And you know, that gave you a, a more well rounded education than someone that would go straight to college. But I just feel like you, you're scratching, you know, you're so close to the top that even, you know, in your 30s, I don't, it doesn't seem to me like it would be automatic that that you couldn't ascend a little bit higher. Okay, maybe I could, but I mean, it would cost me a lot of effort, maybe a lot of money as well, but okay, I would get the money back if I got to top 10 but uh, okay, I if mean, you, yeah, if you did, which is no no sure thing, of course. Yes, I, w- I mean it would require a lot of effort. And the Grandmaster Sosonko recently wrote uh, that to get to the top, you need to, to put chess on the first uh, place in your list on priorities, but on the second and third place as well. I, yeah. I'm not going to do this. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I I can't say for sure that I would I would probably have the same uh, same approach if I were you know at that level. But I was just curious because, like I said, it's refreshing. Uh, yeah. Not it's refreshing how modest you are. Um, so, but let's talk about how you did get to be so good. So, listeners to the podcast always want to know how uh, they always want chess improvement advice. So, do you do you think there's a secret to your to the success you've had? I don't know. I think there is no particular secret, but it was something like a happy coincidence, lucky coincidence, because I mean, uh, I have a chess talent, and uh, fortunately, I realized it, or I started to play chess relatively early at the age of six or seven, which is uh, not so late for a player who uh, doesn't come from a chess family. So to speak, I mean, my parents are not uh, really playing chess. They know the rules. My father is a mathematician, so he can uh, he can play chess uh, without making big mistakes. But okay, my parents are not uh, tournament players, not club players. Uh, so basically, uh, what I wanted to say is that uh, my parents supported me in playing chess. Uh, they invested a lot of uh, time and also money, and I was also supported by uh, some of my trainers, my chess union, and so on. And 
I was very lucky that uh, at each uh, uh, each uh, stage of my career or, or each part of my career, I had a very good trainer for that part of my career uh, when I was growing up, and it helped me a lot. I mean, uh, I was very talented and uh, spent... Uh, I. Okay, when I was very young, I didn't spend so much time on chess, but uh, during the secondary school, uh, I learned how to study, including chess, and it helped me a lot then. And, uh, okay, I was sort of lucky in this respect, but it was not just my uh, success. I mean, it, it is also a success of my parents, of course, uh, of uh, my trainers, uh, also of Czech chess because uh, Czech chess union also supported me quite a lot. I mean, uh, they great. supported me because I had good results, not because of some sort of protection. But okay. well, but that's great that they supported the top players. So you you mentioned that you you learned how to study. What what did you figure out? Okay, I mean, I had to study. Had to use my time. Uh, uh, optimally or not optimally but I had to try at least at the secondary school because I didn't have so much uh, free time I wanted to play chess well and to also study well and to, so okay I needed to use my time when going to the school I'm, I'm traveling by public transport and it might take about 40 minutes so I uh, I was uh, reading something or uh, rather studying something on the way and uh, also on the way back, which is already one hour, 20 minutes. Uh, so, okay, I'm a bit, I'm a bit absent-minded, so sometimes uh, I might forget uh, to take uh, uh, the bus and, uh, sorry, <laughs> get off the bus and uh, uh, and uh, so on, but okay, it's not such a big problem for me. Yeah, it's funny how many super strong players are have that sort of absent-minded streak where you can just forget to get off the bus or miss a turn or be a bad driver. Like, I'm not a great driver. Um, not that I'm a grandmaster, but uh, that's my excuse, that, that I'm a chess player. Yes. Um, so... Did you have any uh, books, or I, I've seen you mention a few books in the past, but do you have any books that you find yourself recommending a lot uh, to aspiring uh, chess monsters? I like almost all the books of uh, Mark Dvoretsky, a top uh, Russian trainer who was very hardworking, and he developed his own methodics uh, and uh, his own method, and uh, he uh, was quite successful in his uh, work. Unfortunately, he passed away uh, last year, uh, or one and a half year ago, or almost two years. Uh, but uh, he wrote many great books, especially his Endgame Manual is uh, just great. Yeah. But, okay, most of his books are also not really easy to read. I mean, he... It constantly asks uh, the readers some tw questions, but uh, his uh, choice of uh, puzzles is quite good. Uh, his choice of examples, because there are characteristics, uh, character uh, sorry, characteristic for the topic, and at the same time, they usually have just one solution. And uh, when there are more solutions, uh, uh, they are all instructive or the. The example is instructive, so I quite like most of his books. Yeah, his his name comes up all the time. I mean, just an absolute legend, and we've had a few guests on, like uh, Jan Gustafsson and Greg Shahadi, who've you know had the pleasure of meeting him or working with him, and they all have uh, nothing but good things to say. So, yeah. Yes. Um, so, what about now? Like for your training now, what do you do? Uh, I mean, you mentioned uh, reading periodicals, but if you're going to like really try to push yourself, what what's your preferred method um, for for trying to work on your chess? Okay, I like to cooperate with my friends among strong grandmasters, uh, play some rapid games, uh, analyze them, uh, study some openings together. I think it's uh, 
stimulating when you are playing against uh, other strong GMs and uh, when you are also analyzing the games afterwards it can uh, help you to discover your uh, your common mistakes or my common mistakes <laughs> huh. my case do you, is there a, a strain to your mistakes that you notice is there one thing in particular Yes, there are several of them. In fact, uh, I know about them, but I don't want to be too concrete in this. But uh, that makes sense. Yeah, can can uh, uh, we know Magnus is listening and taking notes? So we we got to kind of keep it secret. No, I. Um, so I have another question from a listener. Um, you've mentioned that in your interview with Fiona, I believe you mentioned that intuition is a strength of yours uh, when it comes to playing chess. And uh, Sanat Singh Hai asks. Uh, Hi, David. I'm a very analytical player and try to calculate everything out and find moves that are logical. So I find it's hard to trust my intuition and sacrifice based on intuition. I often go for a complicated line that requires very accurate calculation when there's a simple move that will give me a great even winning position. How can one develop and trust his intuition in chess? Okay, I don't know exactly because, okay, I'm not a big trainer, but I think analyzing the games helps quite a lot and I mean not just uh, analyzing with computer I mean uh, uh, like uh, this line is good and the other is bad but okay one should also be able to make some conclusions uh, like uh, that he overestimates the attack quite often and uh, to generalize it somehow to get some feeling for uh, for the positions, uh, for some, I mean, uh, to realize when the attack might be enough and when not, for example. But okay, it's hard to learn something like this because I think that in some cases, like that of Magnus Carlsen, it's inborn. I mean, he needed to work quite hard uh, to to develop his potential to the maximum. But uh, I mean, he. He's uh, obviously more talented than uh, me and <laughs> the, more talented than uh, uh, almost anyone in this respect. Uh, I'm also quite talented uh, in, when it comes to intuition, but not that tal- not as talented as Magnus Carlsen. Uh, so, uh, and there are also other players who are stronger in this respect than me. Of course, I know this, but uh, I mean... And I, I know, I know that you've played Magnus Carlsen. Have you had a chance to analyze with him? Uh, yes, a bit. But uh, we mostly analyzed the games uh, when we were about equally strong. And uh, when we played the last uh, three games, we analyzed one of them, the last one in Shamkir during the press conference. But okay, play, press conference is a bit uh, different. I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah, not just two people. And to, when we played uh, three years ago in Vacancy, uh, we exchanged several words after the game. Uh, I mean, still it was quite interesting for me because Magnus is much stronger. I know that. Uh, but okay, nowadays the players are not analyzing the games as often as they were uh, some decades ago. Yeah, probably because computers uh computers are are all knowing, so not not as much reason to sit there and try to flesh out every variation. Um so having played, I mean I'm sure you've played like I said earlier, probably virtually everyone. Um do you uh do you have any favorite stories like of maybe analyzing like I I know you like I've mentioned earlier you had your match against uh, Karpov many years ago and you you pl- of course played Kasparov in his comeback do you, did you have any memorable experiences analyzing or like uh getting a drink or eating dinner with any um any of these uh f- uh legendary chess players Okay it would take me some time to recall some interesting stories. Uh, I think I have some, but uh, I would need some time. I'm sorry for uh, my uh, speech, uh, distorted speech and so on, because I, I'm having a headache now. And uh, I mean, normally I could speak a bit better, not much. Oh, no, you, you've been great. Um, so, yeah, yeah. If, if any come to mind, let us know. Um, uh, uh, sorry. Pardon, I recall something. Oh, good. Let's hear it. Oh, 
as for those stories, I remember playing uh, a match against Grandmaster Viktor Korchnoi in 2003 when I was about 18 and he was still playing uh, quite actively and uh, I mean he was rated uh, slightly below 2600 at that time and uh, we played two games and in the first one I saved uh, was a rook end game with white and in the second game I won after some sacrifices and uh, then he was not very happy and uh, <laughs> left the playing hall after the game and I showed the game to the spectators and uh, then he came back and uh, told me that he should have played uh, some other move. He was right, by the way. <laughs> right, of course. Hey, uh, okay, I would play this and the position would be unclear because in my understanding unclear means something like approximately equal and double-edged, but okay, it's just my understanding of it and uh, okay he understandably did, didn't quite like the expression unclear because it's uh, somewhat elibistic uh, so he re retorted only for you <laughs> <laughs> so it was quite funny that's funny yeah he's the, i know there's many stories about him being a, a little bit unhappy after after a loss yes but okay this was not a problem really yeah I mean, that afterwards we discussed the games normally and to, okay i mean it, it some people just get emotional up just after the game it happens yeah, I mean that's how you get to be a legend like Korchnoi. If if the if the loss just rolls off your back, you're probably not gonna you know, not gonna be a world class player. Yes. Um, so I have to ask. I mean, obviously we're we're fascinated by all of uh, the the elite players, but playing uh, Kasparov in particular and beating him did did you have a special feeling after that? I mean, I know there were sort of some unusual circumstances to how you won the game, but did, like, how did that feel? Okay, I, I was uh, of course happy, but I was lucky as well because I understand th and I understood even then that I, my position was uh, uh, lost. But okay, I tend to fight till the end in such positions uh, unless I'm in a very poor form. And uh, this time I got lucky because uh, it happens and it happens especially often in rapid chess and blitz because when the clock is ticking uh, and the uh, time table comes, uh, even the strongest players in the world can make uh, mistakes which might seem unex inexplicable uh, from afar. But okay, it just happens to everybody. But okay, it was uh, I was lucky that I won that game and, and that I won it uh, against such a great legend. Um, but okay, I mean, I played that game like every other game in the tournament, but okay, with the difference that I mostly played badly in St. Louis, but uh, I was lucky in this particular game. But okay, for me, it, uh, it didn't matter so much, but uh, for Czech media, it did. And uh, right. I mean, uh, uh, quite some journalists asked me about this and the uh, Chess got into mainstream media, and uh, I mean it was quite good for Czech chess in this respect because uh, chess is not the most popular sport in Czech Republic. I mean it's about fifty is more popular. So okay, yeah. In this respect, it was good. But okay, yeah. I mean Grandmaster Kasparov is a living legend, but he had not played. Uh, big tournament for quite some time before that uh, rapid and blitz tournament so i mean uh, of course it would be something completely different to play such a position against uh, mr gary kasparov uh, at his best uh, period uh, at his peak and he would have won it of course yeah so for those who haven't seen the game it's a nice little trick although i definitely get what you're saying in the like Pete Kasparov uh, would would be unlikely to uh, to fall victim to it, but nonetheless, I'm sure it's nice to have the headlines about beating Kasparov. And uh, they don't write in the headline Navarro gets lucky against Kasparov. They just say you won. So uh, that 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 would be a nice thing to have written, I would think. Yes, about I'm, you. I'm not uh, really boasting 
with this about this but uh, i mean many people are asking me and of course i'm replying uh, to them like this so uh, okay but i once used it uh, when a friend of mine asked uh, me uh, to write uh, uh, to write uh, uh, to some authorities that he is a very talented player which he is so i needed to introduce myself somehow so i right. <laughs> wrote uh, to for the us authorities that i uh, once bet uh, mr gary kasparov in a rapid game or something i mean not because i would um, like to make uh, myself famous or something like this but because it could help um, my friend to uh, uh, I mean, the authorities don't know anything about me. I mean, if they are not playing chess, but uh, all the people know who is Mr. Gary Kasparov. So. Yeah, naturally, that makes sense. Okay, so David, I just have a couple more questions for you if, uh, yes. if you have a bit more time. Great. Uh, one is from supporter of the podcast, Keith Kaiser. Uh, who asks in his write-up on the Gibraltar Open 2018, he states TradeWise is ending its sponsorship of the event and that the reasons and this is in, the reasons are most likely to be related to Brexitus. Could he elaborate on this, and have you heard of any other chess-related consequences of the Leave vote? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm not a specialist in this uh, field, but I, I'm not happy about Brexit because the European Union has many drawbacks, many problems but on the other hand uh, it has ensured stability in europe or at least in western and central europe for many decades and in western europe for uh, for 50 years or even uh, okay for i don't know for how long but uh, despite of uh, of its uh, problems it's uh, good when European countries can uh, act together and uh, so on. And I think, uh, of course, I understand that uh, Britain had some problems resulting from its um, membership in the European Union, but uh, I'm afraid uh, Brexit will not be good for the rest of Europe, probably not for Britain either. And uh, for Gibraltar, it could uh, be a big problem because Gibraltar has a border with Spain and uh, uh, some centuries ago, it was a Spanish territory. Uh, And I mean, Gibraltar is a peninsula which uh, is uh, surrounded by sea and uh, it's only connected with, I mean, it's only connected uh, with, with uh, the European uh, territory, with because of this board, its border with Spain. So, if uh, Spain, uh, I mean, if the relationships between Spain and Gibraltar get worse, it might be in a problem. I mean, if there is a border, it uh, would not be good for Gibraltar. Yeah. Okay, and a uh, follow-up comment from Keith is, r- remind Davi that he has a web page he hasn't updated since 2005 with the yes, Wake Yes, I'm really sorry for this. <laughs> okay, I'm not really focused on it. I even, some, okay, some of my fans even created a fan page and uh, offered it to me and I bought it and it was another one perhaps, but uh, then I didn't have enough time to work on it. Because I'm playing my chess, but uh, I, I'm playing many tournaments and so on, and uh, I'm no expert, at, uh, no expert at the IT. So I know I should do something about it. But well, yeah, I, I'd say uh, keeping up with your chess is more important, and we did hear what your upcoming schedule is. So it sounds like a valid excuse to me, but. Yes, but it is it is funny that it's still up at least uh, I checked it out it's from when he was in university for those uh, for listeners um, uh, okay so last thing David you mentioned before we were recording you might go out uh, to dinner with your girlfriend tonight um, what else do you do for fun when, when you're not thinking about chess do you, do you have any other um, uh, burning passions okay I like reading uh, I mean I'm interested in, in I'm interested in sociology because uh, it was my minor 
at the university uh, and uh, but okay i haven't been reading much uh, recently and okay i'm uh, i like uh, okay uh, reading and uh, i'm interested in uh, what's going on in the world but uh, okay i have no big uh, hobbies uh, i mean uh, i'm not uh, not uh, focused only on chess but uh, on the other hand, uh, there's no other hobby co comparable to chess. Okay, I like foreign languages, which uh, is uh, my big hobby. But uh, recently, I haven't been working much on um, on renewing my knowledge or on keeping my knowledge at least. So I'm afraid I will need to work harder. And okay, but uh, I'm, I'm not sure. just work. I'm not just working on chess all the day. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Well, that's great. Uh, so, David, again, I, I want to thank you for coming on. I mean, your your uh, your modesty is really refreshing. I mean, I, I as I can't help but feel like you're too modest. I mean, you're 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 you've achieved so much in chess. It's so incredible. So, um, I it's it's nice to hear. But I hope you you hold your head up high for all that you've accomplished in chess. Um, and and I really appreciate your time um if if any listeners were interested in reaching you are you on social media at all or you prefer to keep a low profile um where do you stand on uh i prefer to keep a low profile because it's uh, better for me i mean i want to use my leisure time differently i mean uh, i'm i have a girlfriend and i'm going to i'm attending a church and uh, I like reading and I need to help uh, with some help uh, in the household because my mother is working and uh, she is very busy and uh, I'm still living together with my mother because uh, I'm still not living together with living in one house uh, with my girlfriend yet. I mean, we are walking out to with, with each other for only one and a half year or so mm, that's you know it's a long time uh, um okay well awesome i really appreciate it david and good luck in all your upcoming tournaments we'll be uh we'll be uh tuning in and rooting for you okay thank you very much goodbye the new perpetual chess theme music is courtesy of gear vandervelt special shout out to him I also want to thank everyone who supports the podcast. That includes people who tell their friends about it, people who write positive reviews on Apple Podcasts, and most of all, those who have donated to support the show. I spend about five hours a week on each episode, and even though I love doing it, it can be hard to find the time. Without the support of my Patreon and PayPal Perpetual Chess Partners, the show would not be possible. They are Adam Ralph, Adam Van Kooj, Adrian Gutierrez, Andres Chris Dewa. I hope I did okay there, Andres, on your name. Alex Pejas, Chris Wainscott, Chad Hilton, Chris Lott, Christopher Wood, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Chris Flanagan, Daniel Naylor, Daniel Schaefer, Gary Andrews, Greg Shahadi, James Banastia, Jason Dunbar, Jennifer Valens, Jeffrey Martello, John Fernandez, Jen Shahadi, Jen Scream, Jerry Wells, John Thompson, Johnny McMenamin, Kelly Palmer, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Lorraine Dore, Matthew Passy, Macaulay Peterson, Matthew Tedesco, Pascal Charbonneau, Paul Sweeney, Peter Lux, Peter Merrifield, Randy Temple, Ricky Grijalva, Rob Lazorchek, Robert Steiner, Tatia Vabrahamian, Thomas Stonix, Thomas Tachenko, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Todd Bryant, Tony Rotello, Victor Vrenkul, Zhao Cheng, and Zhivko Stoyanov. Thanks a lot, everyone. I'll be back next week with another great...